um, the more technical side of what we've been talking about, and I'm sure a lot of you have questions about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is gear for your dogs. There are so many different harnesses out there. Um, so I think the general rule is if there are a lot of buckles and loops, um, it's probably not a good harness <laughs> for pulling sports. There's a lot of hiking harnesses and backpacking harnesses and all sorts of things that people have devised to sell for hundreds of dollars um, on Amazon. Um, those are probably not what is needed for ski during, but we will talk about the harnesses that are available for ski during and, and what might fit best or work best for the, the activities that you are doing. So the first one I'm going to touch on is called an X-back harness. This is really traditional. It's most widely available. Um, it's made in all sorts of different sizes, materials, colors, reflectives, um, all sorts of bells and whistles, but with this very basic X-back design, which transfers the dog's power all along their body down the line to the human on the other end. Um, this is what you'll often see dogs running races, sprint mushing, as well as long distance mushing, as well as ski juring. Um, and the nice thing about these harnesses is that, you know, many different breeds can wear them, many different sizes can wear them, but you will notice, especially this photo on the right, is that all of these dogs are generally lean and long. Um, so these harnesses work really well for that kind of lean, long dog. Um, it might not work for your, you know, stout Aussie or your stout um, healer, um, but they work really nice. If you have a, a very kind of long, lean dog, these X-back harnesses work really nice. One of the other really nice things about them is that they're really readily available. Um, they're pretty easy to fit and they're relatively cheap. So they can range anywhere from $20. They can be $30 for a custom fit harness and we can share these links. But if your dog's a little bit, you know, funky or a little bit wider, like if they're more of a Siberian or Malamute style that's a bit thicker in the chest, there are a couple companies that will custom make based on your measurements for around $30. And then they go all the way up to the $70 or $80 um, side of things, depending on, on what you want in terms of materials and reflectix. But for getting started, a $20 harness to figure out if your dog likes the sport or not, this is a great way to start. You will see a couple variations as you start getting into the depths of Google and, and manufacturers. Um, a couple that I wanna point out is looking at the chest. So this is a pretty standard chest. It's a long piece that comes down the center of the dog um, from their neck and goes under their arms. And you can get them in this pretty standard one piece, one strip that comes down the chest, or you can get a split chest harness like this. And these split chest harnesses are really nice for deep chested dogs or really houndy dogs. And so that kind of cradles their big deep chest bone rather than riding right on it. Um, so these are some variations. And I just pointed out not to say one is right or, or wrong, but just as you start looking for a harness, you may see some of these variations pop up. Um, so understanding what, they, what they're for or what might work for your dog. I really like this photo of the sprint musher um, because every dog is wearing a different type of harness. And this just re-emphasizes that the best harness um, for the sport is the one that fits your dog. So think about your dog's body type, think about what you're doing and how you can make your dog the most comfortable. So if they're not excited to see their harness and they're not excited to get in it, it could be because it doesn't fit very well and it doesn't feel very well. It's not that they don't wanna run. It's not that they don't wanna work with you and ski with you. It's just that what the gear you're putting them doesn't feel great. So finding a harness that fits your dog's style as well as the activity you're doing is a, is a really important first piece of this. A couple other variations that look similar are the H-back harness and the stick harness. And these harnesses just distri distribute the weight less over the hips and more along the sides. And I just point this out because you'll probably see them come up as you're Googling things. Um, I would say that neither of these harnesses would I recommend for a first um, harness buy, especially for ski juring. Um, these kind of have a very kind of specialized reason why different mushers use these for their dogs. And so if you're buying a brand new harness, I would just say, don't worry about these ones for now. If you have questions about it, or if you have a dog that we think would benefit from one of these, we'll definitely let you know. But for, for now, just don't, don't worry about these guys. The second type of harness I wanna talk about it is a halfback harness. Um, the one on the left is known as the distance harness. Um, and, and the one on the right is a second skin harness. And the idea is that they're both, they stop around the, the dog's mid point on their back. And this is nice for a couple reasons. One is that um, it's it's a little less power transferred from dog to human. So especially on skis, it's nice. It can, if you've got a really strong, powerful, fast dog, it can reduce that power a little bit um, for you. And, and maybe you like that, maybe you don't. 
Um, uh, another thing is that it's really nice to fit a lot of different body points. So I said, you probably don't want a, a harness with a lot of buckles and snaps. This, these harnesses typically have one buckle on the side, which means that depending on the girth of your dog, you can adjust that. You're still gonna need to fit their neck um, and, and the length of the harness, but for stouter dogs, um, like healers and Aussies and that sort of thing, um, they seem to fit the body a little bit nicer. You can also see on the right hand side here that these half harnesses are really nice for a higher attachment point. So on a bike, which sits a lot higher or skiers a lot higher than a sled, which is down near ground level, um, it still lets them put a lot of power into pulling, whereas the X-back harness um, tends likes to pull flat rather than up. Um, so they can be really nice if you're doing a lot of high attachment point sports. Um, they're nice for that. One other reason I really like the halfback, especially when people are first getting started out, um, is that if you have a dog that gets really excited on the trail, so this is a photo of me and my dog Griffin just learning how to ski jour. Um, if you have a dog that gets really excited on the trail, Griffin didn't really like passing other dogs. Um, you might have a, do a young dog that wants to say hi to everyone. The nice thing about the half back attachment point is that you can rein your dog in and that point is pretty close to where their collar would be. So you have a lot of control of holding your dog beside you or reining them in between your legs and having good control over them. Um, the X back, because the attachment point is at their tail, if you're trying to pull them in or have control of them, you're really just swinging them by around by the tail. So if you have a dog that you, that you, you, that you want more control over and that you want to be able to reel in, then the half back is a great is a great um, harness for that. The last harness I'm going to talk about is the free motion harness. This is kind of like the bells and whistles Cadillac version <laughs> that's out there. You'll see a lot of European ski jurors, bike jurors, dry land racers using these harnesses. Um, I know there is one of our members who I think is on the call, Ace uses one, and they, they're really nice too because they can fit a lot of body types because they are, I know I said, no buckles and snaps and stuff. This is probably the one exception because it is made for racing dogs. Um, you can see that there are a lot of pieces to the harness and there are a lot of adjustment points. So that what I really like about this harness and we've used them on some of our dogs is that they have these two strips that run along the spine and you can separate how wide or narrow they are. So depending on how wide or narrow your dog is, you can adjust where those sit and straddle your dog. You still need to fit right for the neck, um, but then on the sides as well, um, you can see that there are buckles to adjust um, the around the girth and there are buckles to adjust their attachment point at the tail. So um, they're really adjustable if you get the size, you still need to size it right, but they're very adjustable. And the nice thing is that because they have those long strips along the spine and the tug line is really flexy, it means the harness often stays really stable even with a higher attachment point. So you can still get a lot of power and your dog stays really comfortable even if you're skiing or biking or running on a sled. Um, so again though, like uh, X-Back harness, you can pick up for about 20 bucks. Um, these are running into the $100 range. So depending on what your budget and what you wanna do, if you're only getting out you know, once a month, you know, a $20 X-Back harness, which are perfectly amazing harnesses, that's what we use, um, is great. If you're doing this a lot and you find your dog um, would benefit from a harness like this, awesome. There's no right answer. Um, the best harness is the one that fits your dog. Um, and everyone's dog is gonna look different, feel different and, and act different. And another thing to note is that your dog might change and need a different size or style of harness depending on whether it's spring or fall. Their muscle development changes, their coat changes, their, their thickness changes. So understanding that you might, um, if your dog looks like it, the harness that you perfectly fit and got custom made for them isn't fitting two months from now, you may need to adjust what they're wearing. Um, so there's a question about harnesses. My dog is not slender. He is a 60 pound Siberian, which harness may be better for his size? So we, I think we're gonna get that question a lot for Siberians. So Ace, who I believe is on the call, um, wears one of those nonstop because they're quite um, adjustable. Um, you can also, like I mentioned, an x harness works totally fine for Siberians, but you may wanna, there's a couple companies, um, Adenac, Alpine, Outfitters, which we'll give you guys the links that will custom fit or are amazing. You can email them, let them know what your dog looks like, what um, size they are, what their measurements are, and they'll help to either direct you to a pre-made harness that's pre-sized or help um, get you for about 30 bucks, make you one that's fit for your dog. 
Um, so that's a really nice way to go. Um, we will next weekend when we're out on the trail, we'll all bring our own personal, you know, supplies of harnesses. Most of them are X-Back harnesses. So we'll walk through how to size them and get your dog in different sizes and see if there's something that we have that fits that then you can just buy online um, or if you're going to need to go the more custom route depending on your dog. So I'm going to leave this for the trail portion next week where we'll talk about sizing your dog for harness, but just know there's a lot of pieces and points and a fit is really, really important. And so you can go online and there's lots of YouTube videos on how to fit a next back harness. Um, Nonstop Dogware, who's made, who makes those free motion harnesses, has a whole thing on their website, how to fit them. So we'll let you guys Google around and dig around a little bit, but definitely feel free to reach out on the Facebook group or email us if you have specific questions, or we can talk about them during the question section as well. Um, but yeah, fit is really, really important. So. Any questions about dog harnesses um, before I move on to human harnesses? If it's about your dog in particular, we can answer it at the end. Um, but if, yeah, I'll move on to human harnesses. <laughs> so um, the, just like dog harnesses, there is a lot of variety in what humans wear too. So this is what this style is what we would call a basic waist belt. Um, it can come either with little leg loops or not, but the idea is that it's around your waist and it's pulling the attachment point is really pulling you at your waist. So sometimes it can feel like you're getting pulled forward, um, but that's kind of where the attachment point is. The next one is what we call the diaper, <laughs> the diaper belt, and it really grabs your butt cheeks. And so where it's pulling you from is by the hips and the butt. So a lot of expert skiers like this, it gives you more power that transfers into your skis. For myself, you've seen how amazing skier I am. I like the hip belt because it's my, my waist can fluctuate separate from my skis. So if my dog is pulling, I have some buffer of adjusting their power before that gets transferred down into my skis. Whereas that diaper, it's going straight from the dog right down to your skis. So you wanna know exactly what you're doing when you're moving down the trail. It's more power, um, but it definitely is, uh, you gotta be good. <laughs> Um, and then the third is like you're getting into the bells and whistles. So you might hear us um, mention this company in a lot, Nonstop Dogware. They do a lot of dry land gear. They do a lot of really high quality. We love their gear. They're really, really expensive for the basic pet dog owner or sport dog owner. Um, and so this is one of their very, very fancy multi-sport harnesses. Um, you can see it's a combo of the waist and the diaper method. So they're really hitting all the bells and whistles. And then this is another example of it's a basic waist belt, but there's pockets and there might be a water holder. So there's this whole variety in between and really similar to a dog. It's what the best belt or harness for the human is what fits what you want to do and what is most comfortable for you. There, that's, that's harnesses for humans. So the last piece of gear um, in terms of like getting onto the trail is tow ropes. Um, and they, again, all shapes, sizes, all sorts of things. I'm gonna touch on just a few of the basic ones. Some, the, the key piece is that there is a bungee. Whatever you're using is that there's some sort of shock absorber bungee so that when your dog pulls, you have some measure of you know reacting to that rather than just it being a static line that's just yanking you about and you yanking your dog about. So that bungee is really important. So this one on the left is like, it looks like a basic leash, but has a bungee incorporated into it. The one on the top right is more classic for like what we, we use, um, more common, cheaper. Um, they're a hollow poly rope that has a bungee inserted into it. And you can see that one on the top right, it's basically all one piece with a bungee put in. The one on the bottom right is kind of a combo. It has a shock cord and then you can attach tug lines off of the end of it. And I really like this style because you can, if you have one dog or two dogs, you can attach multiple lines off the front. Um, my husband's crazy. He ski drawers four dogs sometimes. So you can attach, um, you can change how many lines you have coming off the front. Um, but it's kind of depends. If you only have one dog and you'd like it to second as a leash, then maybe going the leash style is good for you. Um, for those that answered on the our registration form that you want to buy a rope, we do, they all came in on time, which is awesome. So they've got a bungee inserted, they're the poly ropes, they have snaps. 
and then we'll talk about this but they also have a quick release that's going to go between you and the dog so that if things get real sour and you're about to break a leg, you can release your dog and let them go. Um, and it's kind of a, a secondary safety measure that we have built in there. So um, those of you who said you want a line, I'm gonna send out an email for you to confirm. I think we ordered them before we had all the responses in. So we might be a couple short. So we'll just, I'll send an email out and you guys can let me know who wants a line, who doesn't. And we'll make sure that we're all set up for those who wanna purchase lines for next week. We will, if you're not sure yet, and you're kind of on the fence of like, I really like skiing, my dog is active, but I don't know if I want to invest in all this gear yet, we will have some extra bungees available for you to try, and then you can figure out what you want to get moving forward. Um, but we will have those um, available next week for those who want to pre-purchase them as well. So um, skis, let's talk about skis before you go launching into midair. Um, uh, many of you have asked us already, can I just use my Alpine touring gear? Can I use my downhill skill, skis? Like, what do I need to ski tour with? Um, I would say it's pretty common across the board to say cross-country skis. You want Nordic skis. It gives you the best control, but also the ability to help your dog. You need to be able to move yourself down a flat trail and not have to rely on gravity to take you there. So having skis that give you control and turning cap capabilities and the ability to move quickly on a flat surface, as well as control on hills, um, is important. We always say that it's best, especially when you're first starting, to use skis that do not have metal edges. So options for that are Nordic skate skis, which are more like a gliding pattern, or Nordic classic skis, which are more uh, uh, straight up and down. And you can use either. I think as people get experienced with skate skis um, and get better at skiing, they really, I know a lot of people who really enjoy skate skiing. You can be faster, you can help your dog more, you have more freedom in what you're doing. I use classic classics, but I use a skate ski style with my classics because my dog is doing the, a lot of the power for me. So it's a bit about what you're comfortable with. If you have classic skis, use them. The best skis you have are the ones you have that don't have metal edges and that get you down the track. <laughs> but so skate skis or classics are totally fine. As you get into racing, if you get into racing, skate skis is what people tend to prefer. Um, a lot of backcountry stuff. So what Jen and Michael do a lot, what we end up doing a lot, where you're breaking trail and in the powder, you may end up with backcountry Nordic cross-country skis that do have metal edges. I would just say that's not what you want to start with. Um, metal edges can take off toes really quickly and can destroy backs of legs if you aren't a great controlled skier. Even if you're an amazingly controlled skier, if your dog is inexperienced, they're chasing squirrels or maybe trying to find an in-heat female, whatever it is, it may be that you're in total control, but your dog is in total control. So again, thinking about the safety of yourself and your dog. And especially at our meetups, when there's lots of dogs and lots of people, you and your dog might be amazing, but the guy beside you might not be. So thinking about that when we're thinking about putting on skis for meetups or just even on our own, cross-country skis are the best without metal edges when you're first starting out is what we would recommend. One other thing I'm going to say about skis, sorry, is that if you aren't a super great skier and you're just starting out, I often ski without my poles. It's one less thing to think about as you're moving down the trail and you're not going far on your first couple of runs. It gives you the chance to hold and take care of your tug rope. It gives you a chance to deal with your dog without having to also worry about poles going flying and hitting dogs and all sorts of stuff. So if you are a little bit new to skiing, on the first couple meetups, going without poles might be the way you want to start. Um, it's just, just an option for you. So I mentioned quick releases, which just popped up here. There's a bunch of different styles. We've purchased the top ones for anyone who wants to order a line. Um, and these will get put into your line system so you can release your dog from you. Um, and they can also be used, like I was saying, at the start of your line, hooked up to a vehicle so that you have total control where it's, you know, your line's being held by your car before you get your skis on. You get your skis on, you pop the quick release, and there you go down the trail. So these are really, really useful tools. I'm going to caveat this by saying if you see Michelle, Jen, or I on the trail and we have a locking carabiner <laughs> attaching our dog to us, um, it, we don't recommend it, um, but we do. it. So it's a little bit of what you're comfortable with. And if you're brand, brand new to it and you have a dog that's good with your off-leash recall, um, sometimes having that panic release um, is a really nice safety measure to have in your system. Helmets um, are a great thing. 
Um, that's all I'm gonna say about that, especially on hard packed groom trails. Um, you're gonna go flying all over the place, um, having a helmet, especially at some of the first couple meetups might not be a, a bad thing if you have one sitting in your closet. And then two last kind of minor things, but pretty, pretty straightforward, bring poop bags, always pick up and clean up after ourselves on the trail and bring water for both yourself and your dog. So having, you know, somewhere on your waist belt to carry some things or having a small backpack with a couple items in it, um, having water and a way to water your dog. So a small collapsible bowl or something that they can, uh, your hand for them to drink out of, but having a way to water your dog as well as yourself um, because you're working just as hard as they are. So water, snacks, those sorts of things. If you're planning on being out more than a mile, you never know what's gonna happen out there. So being prepared um, with extra layers and jackets for yourself um, sweating and freezing is a big thing. So being prepared on the trail, even if you're only planning on going for a little trip, we've all been there. Oh, I'm just going for half an hour and two hours later, you make it back to the car. So be prepared um, with at least the bare basics of what you need. And so with that, you're pretty much ready to go. You know your commands, you know how to train your dog, you know how to put on all your gear. And so now you can start ski journey. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jen.